الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب الشاهي صدري وسلي أمري وأهل الأقطة من الثاني فوق قولي وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله السلام عليكم everybody hope you're all doing well on this uh, very rainy day الحمد لله for the rain we definitely need it and uh, alhamdulillah, mashallah, jazakallah khair to everybody for taking the time to come out in the rain. And for those, of course, who couldn't make it, we are just starting, inshallah. So we'll be, uh, everything, inshallah, will be working with regards to the live stream. So we'll be uh, we'll be streaming on the internet as well. Alhamdulillah, cool. So soon going to do a quick recap, and we're still on this chapter, uh, chapter 14 of the book, which is on following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... There's a lot of things that could be said, and Imam Haddad definitely condensed a lot, a lot, a lot in this chapter, such that we've been going over it now for, for a couple of weeks. So we'll be aiming to wrap it up today, inshallah. So a couple of things for us to just remember with regards to the importance of following the sunnah. Where we left off, we were talking about the sunnah of food and the sunnah of eating. And there's basically this idea in our tradition of uh, you are what you eat, right? Like that's very, very prevalent in our tradition. You'll see it throughout the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu throughout the way the Sahaba conducted themselves and throughout the way that the early generations known as the Salaf, that they would conduct themselves. And there was a high emphasis on being very, very careful about the food that somebody consumed. Because at the end of the day, if someone's eating food that is, and the animal has gone through suffering, the animal has gone through difficulty, the animal has gone through major, major problems, been fed all these types of hormones, uh, and then the animal is not sacrificed in the name of God, then when that food enters someone's body, of course, it's not pure. It's impure for a variety of reasons. It's not only impure, it's impure, and it would be considered um, uh, just problematic from the way that the animal was treated. And then all of the different feelings that were going on and the different negative aspects, spiritually, we believe in our religion that they will enter into our uh, body and they will inform the way that someone behaves. So the Prophet ﷺ indicated many times that somebody who eats permissible and eats halal is going to do halal actions, and somebody who eats haram will do haram actions. And it's 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 kind of like a table stakes understanding that the Sahaba and the Salaf had that we've actually forgotten in our times. We sometimes think that it's possible to live very very. Uh, practical lives of righteousness and very, very focused lives of righteousness without focusing on our food. That's just not the case. As many of the scholars say, the spiritual path is linked at the beginning to two things, the source of someone's food and the source of someone's income. And if both of those are not in the correct place, there is no starting on the spiritual path. Someone, of course, is still a Muslim and they're still believing in Allah and so on and so forth, but to get to the higher degrees of spirituality where somebody actually is trying to get into closer levels of nearness, the, the food intake becomes very, very uh, important and very, very critical. And so we mentioned a couple of different things last time, just, you know, the, the, main, the main topic here, or the main takeaway is that somebody should try to uh, really, really focus on eating halal and tayyib food, that, that food slaughtered in the name of God and, and name of Allah and food that is also pure. Uh, and then the importance of halal income, we talked a little bit about that, right? But as we go through our lives, we're going to have various opportunities that, present the, uh, that are presented to us with regards to the type of job that we can do. And a Muslim should be very, very careful and scrupulous to make sure that, hey, the income someone is earning is not from an impermissible source or from a haram source. What ends up happening when the food and the income, the foundations of someone's kind of worldly life are um, not from the right sources, without even Okay, so we'll move on then to the next to the next section. Um, so next, he gets into again. Imam Haddad's going to cover everything. So he's about to cover like the sunnah of when you are he, uh, going to use the restroom, the sunnah after you're done using the restroom, the sunnah of cleaning, and the sunnah of sneezing, uh, the sunnah of uh, intimacy as well. Right. So he's going to cover all these different types of sunnahs, just so that the believer knows that hey. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the most amazing parts of our deen is that nothing is left out. Literally, nothing was out. Every, you, you will find everything in, uh, in this deen. The deen is perfect. It has been perfected. It might not mean, it's like someone, 
someone can't just like open a verse of Quran and so there'll be a verse about, you know, Bitcoin or something, but there will be the foundational principles in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet will be there to help the people of knowledge and insight do the analysis that they need to, to make a ruling on something, right? But in the practical everyday life, yes, Alhamdulillah, everything is there. So uh, one of the core aspects of that is the relationship that a believer has, right? That the relationships you have with your community, the relationships you have with your family, and Allah, one sec, sorry, this keeps disconnecting. Bismillah. Bismillah. So the relationship that somebody has with their community, the relationship someone has with their family, and, and so on and so forth. And so at the at the root, uh, at the start of this is the relationship that someone has with their family. And so what they say usually is you first work on yourself, then you work on your family. Then if, if you're, you're good, your family, inshallah, you'll be able to influence them to be good. If your family is good, now you start to think, okay, how can I help small pockets of my community? Once your community starts to thrive, now how can you collectively go and impact society? As society in general starts to thrive, now how can you go and impact the world? You don't start with the world when yourself, you haven't even focused on yourself yet, right? That the, the, and, and the family is like completely, like they say in, in um, there's like a proper way to say it in Urdu, but like the, the, the barber who, Everybody else's hair is cut so nicely and he never he ne his hair is like a complete mess. Never has time to cut his own hair. Um, and you, you do also want to make sure to take care of yourself. Allah says in the Quran, save yourselves and your families from the fire. He says, start with yourself. And he says in the Quran, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. So you have to start with yourself, right? Um, and so he's going to get into the importance here now of family. And so, he, so we'll start with the sunnah of marriage. And that the, the sunnah of the Prophet is to, that, to get married, right? Like the believer is somebody who, once they reach the right age, and that's going to be different depending on someone's abilities, depending on someone's financial abilities, and so on and so forth. At minimum, when someone is physically able to, when someone has, hit, had, has, has, has reached the age of maturity, post-puberty, and reached the age of maturity, right? And someone is capable, and, and then someone is, you know, let's say for a man, generally financially able to support, and so on and so forth and someone is, you know, emotionally ready, marriage becomes important. But it is very, very important in our tradition to get married. The Prophet ﷺ highly emphasized it. It's not fard, but it can become fard. It can become, or it's not, it's not obligatory, sorry, but it can become obligatory. How does it become obligatory? If somebody's desires are so out of control, they're not able to control them, and they're getting caught up in haram all the time, constantly flirting with people, constantly, you know, doing other things with people, using, you know, Tinder and so on and so forth. Right now, it starts to become a problem, and someone's like, "No, no, no! You better get married." Right? It's no longer optional for that person because that person needs it in order to constrain, uh, control themselves. Right? And of course, there's many, many, many other benefits to it, but at minimum, from that perspective, right? And so, in our tradition, we do not have the idea of delaying marriage. We do not have that idea. Right? We should not wait until we're like way, way, way like, "Oh, I got to accomplish." Many times, people will 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 say. Oh, I have to do A, B, C, I have to go to grad school, I have to find the cure to cancer, I have to do this, 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 then I'll get married, right? I have a list of things before getting married. In the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, it would be, no, you get married as you are able to, right? And you live a humble life until you are able to live the type of life that you want to live because the risk, the provision is ultimately from Allah. It's not going to be from the employer or from, you know, so on and so from someone else, right? But somebody does, does take the means. Um, so that's something to, to remember, remember with regards to marriage. The other thing to remember with regards to marriage is the Prophet ﷺ told us how to do everything, like in marriage. Right? He told, he taught men, this is how you treat your wife. These are the rights that your that your wife has. He taught women, these are the rights that your husband has. This is how you treat your husband. He taught both parents, this is how to treat your children, and how to raise children. He taught every the whole family, this is how to function as a family, right? Every nothing was left out, and it's amazing because you there's not a single person in history who you have enough or this much of a transparent view into like the Prophet ﷺ. You can't find anybody like this. That you can literally, every part of their life, it's, you, can, you can figure out what's going on to the point where we know what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do in the bedroom with regards to intimacy. And that's the, the dua that Imam Haddad is about to share is with regards to the sunnahs of intimacy, right? But the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I want my community at every moment to know this is how, this is the way. 
I don't want to leave anything out for them, right? He covered cleanliness. He's covering using the restroom and so on and so forth. So the marriage, again, the first point here is that marriage is absolutely essential in our tradition. It's not, it's not fard, but it can become obligatory on somebody if someone is not able to uh, manage things. And then it is a very important sunnah, though, to follow, right? To follow um, for someone to, to, to do so. And when someone is ready, then it becomes, as, as Imam Haddad mentioned in the early sections on requiring knowledge, when someone is ready, now it becomes obligatory on you to go and learn the, not, the requirements of marriage. That means you would learn the, um, what, what is my responsibility as a man? What is my responsibility as a woman? What are the, the rights and responsibilities? What am I supposed to be doing? And then somebody would also learn the, uh, the, the fiqh of, 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 of marriage and then the fiqh of divorce. Both you have to learn once you enter the stage where you are getting married. Before you're, when you're not married, even if you're marriageable, you don't have to learn it, right? But you get to the point where, like, okay, now I'm actually entering into this. We got to learn it. Because otherwise what ends up happening is people without even realizing it are like majorly transgressing bounds, right? Either with the spouse or with Allah because the, uh, the what are called the ahkam, the rules of marriage are not being followed. And then same thing, people all the time can easily slip into divorce. Not very difficult, right? If someone doesn't learn the rules because like, there's rules in fiqh about if you say something, even if you don't actually use the specific words, but you have any level of intention there and it's said in an angry way, it could count as, 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 as divorce. Right? So someone has to learn these types of things. So that would be where well, this isn't uh, you know, a fiqh discussion, but that would be important for us to do and for us to learn. Then the Prophet also taught, hey, this is what you look for in a spouse, right? He said you could look for, um, you could look at looks, right? You could look at wealth. You could look at the family that they come from, and you could look at the deen and their religiosity. And he emphasized, but look at their religiosity first, as that's critical. He didn't say you don't have, you're totally, it's totally okay to make sure you're physically compatible and attracted to somebody and that you feel like, hey, they come from a good family. But that should not be like, oh, I really want to just make sure that, you know, they, they look great on Instagram, but like I could care less about their religious um, uh, morality and so on and so forth. What ends up happening if it's too superficial is that people will not be able to uh, go beyond that superficial level, right? Religiosity is absolutely essential for the husband and for the wife to look for, right? And you examine, okay, it doesn't mean, and nobody's perfect, but like, is someone trying to get better? That's probably one of the most critical traits is, hey, are you on a path where you're trying to get better versus like, hey, I'm good. I don't want to ever, you know, I'm, 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 I'm already you know, at the place I'm going to be, and there's no work that I, I need to do, right? And that would be kind of categories that somebody would consider. And, and then, of course, in addition to that, is somebody praying, is someone actively praying, and so on and so forth, right? Do, we, we don't want to expect that fa good, wholesome um, families will be raised while somebody does not have um, uh, good, wholesome families will be raised if the parents are, of course, not exemplifying and are, are, are functioning as exemplars of religiosity and morality. So then he gets into now, into the specific du'as that somebody would recite. Um, so there are other du'as that, like, you know, that someone might do on the first night of marriage and so on and so forth. But this is the, the du'a that when someone approaches their spouse, right, from intimacy, there's a du'a that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say, which is, Bismillah, Allahumma, janabna shaitana wa janabna shaitana ma razaqtana. That, oh Allah, in the name of Allah, oh Allah, keep shaitan away from us and from that offspring that you give us. Now, what is the Prophet ﷺ teaching us here in this du'a? What does is, what is Allah want us to, to say? And Allah wants us to, in the moment when someone is engaging with their spouse, Allah actually wants you to remember him first. And then to seek protection. Seek protection from the devil and seek refuge in Allah. Because the shayateen, they're trying to get involved and trying to mess up that relationship. It's one of the main things the shayateen want to do. As it's mentioned in the traditions that the different shaitan, the different shayateen, they come back to the chief devil, to Iblis, and they report to him. They're like, all right, what did you do today? He's like, oh, I got someone to, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not quoting directly from the examples because I, I forgot the exact examples. Um, but, you know, I got someone to steal today. Like, okay, decent job. Oh, I got somebody to you know, cheat today. Okay, not bad. Um, you know, I got somebody to, to tell a major uh, lie today and break, break their oath. Okay, pretty good. And then he, someone else comes, oh, I, 
I caused dissension between a husband and wife such that they divorced. He says, you, you come close to me. You've done the real deed. You've done the big deed, right? They, they compete in the bad deeds that they do and they go to their boss and he gives them rewards and you know, promotions and so on and so forth based on the bad deeds that they get people to do. And so he said, or that they, that they actually inspire, right? And these are, these are the, the insinuations of the shayateen. So he said that this was such a big deed that he was happy with it. It doesn't mean that divorce is a satanic thing. That's not what we're saying here. But that when shaitan, he's trying to get in between a husband and a spouse. He's trying to get in between a husband and a spouse. And he's trying to get in between them at all times. In, in normal life, and as we learn in this dua, in intimacy and in the offspring that somebody is blessed with, such that we are taught that, oh Allah, we ask that you keep Satan away from us in this situation and in the offspring that you might, that, that inshallah you bless us with, right? And so that is the dua that somebody would do when uh, in, in intimacy. Yes, Sidi Fenton. That also lines up with the idea of intention. Yes. You have, you put an intention into the act of loving with your spouse. So instead of, you know, it, it becomes an act of worship. And, you know, if we can really have intention in these things, it's better. Excellent. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, the point was made around intention and why intention is so important. And so again, the du'as, what they're helping us do is they're bringing mindfulness and intention, uh, the intention into everything that we do. Right? And so somebody, when they're generally about to engage in an act that is primarily related to physical desires, no, 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 stop and remember Allah first. Right? And seek refuge in Allah and from any, any negativity that could be um, formed. And again, this idea of presence being so, so, so important. Now, um, the other thing the Prophet ﷺ taught us is that when someone is with their spouse, it's, they're literally getting good deeds right, in, in that action because they could be doing the same thing with, in a, in a non-permissible way and they would be getting sins, right? They would be committing zina. And so the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, they asked him, do we really get good deeds for being with our spouse? Like they didn't expect that. Eh, good deeds related to praying and fasting and so forth. He says, wouldn't you get a sin? If you were doing it in the haram situation, they said, yes. He says, so you get a good deed when you are doing it in the permissible situation, right? And so again, this is where we don't have an ascetic tradition. It's not like the Christian tradition, which not the entire Christian tradition, but parts of the Christian tradition, which promote the idea of monasticism, right? And like just completely ignore all the desires and never get married and so on and so forth. That's not our tradition. Our tradition is that somebody... Actually, no, Allah gave the human being desires for a reason, but he gave them halal, permissible channels for that desire. Now it's up to that person whether they're not gonna, they're gonna exercise those permissible channels and go after them or whether they're just gonna get caught up in, in haram, right? And so especially in a society where there's so much promiscuity, so, much, uh, so many sexual references and innuendos and from a young age that people... From young ages know about this stuff. From young ages now, the average age that, according to statistics, that uh, teenagers are having intercourse is like 12 or 13 now, that many of them began the young, at a younger age. It's crazy. Absolutely insane. And so as Muslims, we can't live with the idea that like, oh, I have to wait until I'm way old to get married and just make all the mistakes in between. That's not the way of the Muslim. Muslim is like, no, when I'm, when I'm ready and I know that this is something I need to do, they go and they do it. Right? And they, they go and they talk to their parents. And they have a discussion with them. And if you can't convince your parents, you can't convince other people, you bring to them the evidences from the sunnah gently, not in like, oh, look at what this is and throw the book at them. No, 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 nicely. You know, I, you raised me and I love you. And, you know, I think I'm, I'm ready. They're like, You're not even close to ready. You don't even fold your laundry yet. And they're like, no, 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 it's different. I'm ready. And they, they you slowly have that conversation with them, right? But it is, it is very, very important to not wait to not wait till someone is, again, there's not like a specific age cut off here, but everybody knows at, at, at which point, right? Um, so the next, just want to finish point, but is it, is it a question? Okay, yeah, so we'll just, just let me finish point, inshallah. Um, so, so that is the, the with regards to, um, you know, someone's literally getting good deeds. And then he gives, you know, general indications of like how somebody would approach that, right? Um, but, that he, he mentions regarding whether it is better to marry. Um, he said that it is to do what is better and safer from a religious standpoint. So it is extremely reprehensible for those who are not married 
to think about the opposite gender in a way that increases their desire for them. Extremely reprehensible, right? For a man to think about a woman who's not, you're not married and think about a woman in that, in that way. And for a woman to do the same with a man. He's, he's saying that's, that's, that's not what you want to do. So anyone thus afflicted in such a different time that they're living in. Because these days, it's like it's all over the place. Someone's on social media, someone's on the internet. Some, it's just like completely commonplace for there to be all of these constant pushes and constant pushes such that the, 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 the thoughts of somebody from young ages, again, high school and earlier, get clouded with these types of things. Generally speaking, that, you did, that did not used to be the case, right? Which is why we know we are living in the, in the end of times. And Prophet some prophesized many, many, many things, of them being that morality will, de- will, will slowly, slowly decline. There'll be general moral degradation and sexuality will become more and more open and rampant, right? And, and, and people will begin to do things literally publicly that they would never think to do, right? Never, never, never think to do. And so he says, anyone thus afflicted and unable to control it with acts of worship, the thought can come, you're not held accountable for the thought. You're held accountable for acting on the thought, right? That's one point that's important to remember. So someone could have a bad thought and then they say, Astaghfirullah, A'udhu Billah, and Shaitan Rajeem, and they're not held accountable for the thought. But the minute they go and they act on the thought, that the text message starts, the flirting starts, the whatever starts in an impermissible way, the cheating starts, an affair starts, whatever it is, whatever stage that somebody is in, now the accountability begins, right? And it's very, very dangerous to fight. So he says, whoever can't control with acts of worship, right, must get married. If they are literally unable to, like, nothing, nothing that they can do, there's nobody who they could potentially have, have, have that relationship with. Um, they can't approach the, co- the topic of marriage financially, whatever it is. And he says you fast a lot. Fasting is one of the cures for, um, for sexual desires, right? Like cures for impermissible sexual desires. Somebody fasts and fasts and fasts and it will tame things. There's a direct link between food as the first appetite that the, most, that, the, that the human being has, and then this second appetite, these are the two chief appetites Imam Ghazali mentions in the Ahiyal al that these are the two chief appetites of the human being, food and sexual desire, right? And so somebody who's able to control both, you've got a major control, a major part of your nafs under control. Someone who's not able to control either is like, essentially very similar to the animals who have, they don't have any control over this, right? Literally animals, all they want to do, if you have a pet, they just want to eat a lot. Like they constantly want to eat. And if you have, uh, if, if someone has seen animals in general, like how often animals will procreate, there is no idea of like controlling. That's not really, they're not, they don't have that, that, that level of, uh, and they're not required to either. But the human being, we're not like the animal. There is a stage where the human being is like the animal called the nafs al-amara, bisu, the first level of the, of the ego, of the soul, which is the evil commanding soul. And it's, it's, it's essentially the animal soul, where the animal instincts inside of the human being is uh, in control. And so there's a lot of people in society where they never graduated to the next level, and they're like in very powerful position of society. And then they end up com- having affairs and having all these different things happen, because they're still following their animal soul. No matter how high in a position somebody gets, if they have not conquered the animal soul, they've never really progressed. Doesn't matter if someone's 20 and has conquered it, or if someone is 70 and has not conquered it. The person who's 20 and has conquered it is more, has progressed more than the person who's 70 and has not conquered it, right? And so if someone gets to the age of, you know, some of the political folks that we've seen in our time, and they can, still can't control this, it's a big, big, big problem, right? But the believer, we're taught from, from, from early ages and stages that, no, this is something you control. And one of the ways to help with that is, um, is marriage, right? And so that's why marriage becomes so important. Now, if someone is looking for a spouse and they, they're unable to get, find, find somebody, um, there is a dua that is recommended that somebody would do the du'a is the du'a of Sayyidina Musa. And you can do this for a lot of different situations. But this would be one where someone would say, Audhu Billah Shaitan Rajeem, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ila, uh, ilayya min khayrin faqir. That my Lord, indeed I am in need for whatever good you would send down to me. 
I'm in need for whatever good you may send me. And someone in, in there, when, when you're in states of dire need, this is an amazing du'a to do. This is the du'a that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, he did as he fleed from, um, uh, from the people who were chasing him uh, after he left the town of Pharaoh, not when he fleed from Pharaoh during the, the time with his entire, with all of Bani Israel, but when he was younger. And he got to a place known as Madian. And he, there he stopped at a place um, and he made this dua that Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir that Ya Allah and he was thirsty and hungry and he was in a difficult state that Ya Allah I am in need for whatever good you may send down to me whatever good you may send down to me and then what happens after that not too long after that he gets to this kind of you know watering hole where they would water their animals um, and he sees two uh, uh, women struggling with watering the animals. All the men are watering their animals first and like they're not giving him, giving him turns. So he's like, do you guys need help? He, 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 sees, he, try, he approaches them in a, um, uh, and they're, they're, they, they accept the help that he's offering, right? And then they bring him to their father. The father is also a prophet known as Prophet Shu'ayb alayhi salam with, uh, according to the dominant opinion. And their father, um, uh, he then here's the whole story of the difficulty and the oppression that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam has been through. And then he offers him employment. And then also along with that, right, he, you know, after he evaluates Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, and of course this is a prophet of Allah, and there's another prophet of Allah, and so there's a very special connection that they will have. Then he actually says, after this period of time that you spend with me and that you will work with me, right, that I would, you know, um, uh, want you to get married to my daughter. Right. And so then after that period of time, uh, eight to 10 years, then the, they, they get married and uh, then Musa alayhi salam leaves. And as after he leaves that, then the conversations with Allah directly begin, right? That he is the burning bush and so on and so forth. But the point is, this is a dua that somebody would do when they're in extreme need. And it is also a dua someone would do if they are struggling to, um, or they're not even struggling. They're just at the point where, hey, now I want to get married. And they would do uh, this dua. Alhamdulillah. So that's on the topic of marriage and um, uh, intimacy. Alhamdulillah. Um, does anybody have any questions before we move on to the next topic? Oh. The mic has a question. Yes. Yeah, good question. So the question was the animal soul, what, at what time does it start? So it's essentially the stage that the human being is in until they get out of that stage. So it's basically like that you have levels of, this, of the soul. The first level is this animal soul. The next level is known as what's called nafs al-lawama, the self-blaming soul. And this is the soul that starts to actually like call itself out. Like, no, 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 no. You, it messes up. It's like, you shouldn't have done that, right? It's like, the first one barely feels guilty, doesn't really feel guilty. As soon as guilt and feeling bad and repentance and so on start to enter, one is kind of starting to kind of graduate between or to the next level, right? Uh, but that's the level that somebody is at. So uh, you're, you might never leave it, right? Someone could literally be 80 years old and still be in that. Um, or someone very early, right? It's kind of once they're, they've hit the age of puberty and they're held accountable and they start to work on themselves very quickly goes to the higher levels. After that one, um, uh, so there's two ways. There's like a couple of different ways that they mention it. The most basic way is the first level is the animal soul. The second level is kind of this self-blaming soul. And the third level is what's called the nafs al-mutma'inna, the um, peaceful and serene soul. This is the soul that it is in a complete state of peace. And as Allah says in the Quran, Ya al nafs al-mutma'inna irji ila rabbika radiyatan mardiyya. That, oh, tranquil soul. Come to your Lord in a state of uh, that you are pleased and Allah is pleased. And enter my Jannah. Enter my Jannah. Enter my slave. Enter my Jannah. Like Allah is so pleased with this soul. And you're, this soul is in a complete state of serenity with Him. It's, it's, it's a regular dua that we should all make. That, Ya Allah, let me attain the state of having a nafs al inna, a serene soul, a soul that's not, it's a, it can, the, 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 the turpidities of life come, but that soul is calm through them. This is how you know 
when we talked about this, I think maybe many weeks ago about anxiety, how somebody knows, hey, they're progressing. As anxiety comes, but someone's able to conquer it and calm down very easily. But the more someone is in a constant state of being frazzled all the time and just not calm and just like you can tell something's off, that means a lot of work has to be done. It's normal. We all have that. But, it, but you'll see around, around, like, for example, the Prophet Islam, he's, of course, at the highest soul. Right? He was what's called insan al-kamil, the perfected human. That at that level, at, at the levels of the righteous, that they are very, very calm through difficulty. And it's a way to tell how advanced someone is in their spirituality, is when difficulty comes, where are they at? And so the serene soul, it's serene. It's tranquil, right? And the, 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 the animal soul, it loses it. Just like an animal loses it completely, right? Just can't handle, can't handle it, right? That that, that, that would be. And then, and then, of course, the, the self-blaming soul is the one that is oscillating between the two and is struggling sometimes and not. But like, it's the stage where, of course, we're in for a long period of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, so basically, in general, so the question was um, that we mentioned uh, around marriage and the status of marriage. Is it, you know, sunnah? Is it obligatory? And so on and so forth. That it is a sunnah of the Prophet. It's, so it's, it's, it's very important that someone try to follow the sunnah. However, it's not required, right? But if somebody cannot control themselves, right, then they have to get married. Like it becomes wajib on that person it's no longer optional. Does that make sense? Because now they have a halal means and they're still not pursuing the halal means. And this is where it becomes important to, to kind of weigh. Um, it's not only about finances and jobs and so on and so forth. There's other th spiritual things at, at play here. Yeah. Oh, uh, we were just reviewing around um, food and just like the importance of halal food, what we covered last time. Yeah, yeah. Nothing on this topic though. Sorry? Yeah, food and source of income. Um, yes, question. The question was that can a Muslim reach the level of immense nearness to Allah without getting married? That's a really good question. Um, Allahu alam, I don't know. that. Like, who Allah brings near and not is in, is in Allah's hands. Um, in general, that the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is the main way, right? So, for example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the famous Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who, um, and may Allah reward him in abundance for the sacrifices he gave for this deen. Uh, he is one of the founders of the four madhabs, and he is the, the one who held on to the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, when there was a lot of persecution and innovations coming into the religion. So he literally was so adamant about following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallam that very soon after his blessed wife, uh, Allah bless her and, 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 and forgive her and increase her and encompass her in her mercy, in his mercy, very soon after she passed away because he didn't want to stray from the sunnah. And it, he was like in an older stage at this point, but he like got married, right? So it was, it was very, very important to, to many of these people to be in that stage. However, there are people that have attained very, very high stations that have not been married before. And so it is not a requirement um, that if somebody is doing the farth actions and someone is doing what they are able to of the extra actions, then alhamdulillah, there's definitely possibility there. Uh, there's definitely like Allah's decision there, right? And, and there are, there's definitely examples of saints that, is meant, that are mentioned in the books that were not married and that kind of um, uh, attained very high levels of ma'rifah and gnosis. The, the ones though that follow the sunnah in every minute aspect will, from my understanding, again, Allah knows best, will attain higher, if that makes sense. Um, but again, it's not a kind of requirement. A lot of things, it depends on individual circumstances. What we're talking about right now is like general circumstances and then individual circumstances come up, right? Where somebody might just like, uh, I believe Imam Noe, actually, I believe Imam Noe. Do you know, Sidi, if this is Imam Noe, I believe he wasn't married. Hmm. 
Right. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, the, the general, the general inclination is based Imam Haddad is saying that the best choice is that which is safer from the religious point of view. Right. And so you kind of aside, decide what is safer from the religious point of view, but there have been scholars and others from the tradition um, and saints, women and men who have not been, you know, who have not been married. Um, and then there are, of course, the, the example that, 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 the, that the, the Prophet Islam said, where he said the marriage is, is, is you know, uh, from my sunnah is obviously important to, to follow. So it's kind of like a decision I would make when, when if someone is deciding like that big of a decision, istikhara becomes really important. And so someone asks Allah, like, should I get married? Should I not? Right. And assuming that somebody is fine with their desires and able to control themselves, it's very important to consult Allah in that and to ask him and to ask him to guide you and to do the istikhara prayer. That's, that's the prayer of where we seek guidance from Allah. And you pray two units of prayer and then you do the dua of istikhara and ask Allah for guidance for at least a week or two weeks and to, to get that um, guidance. Does that answer the question? Okay. Yes, question. I can't, I, sorry, I can't hear you because, yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yep, really good question. So the question was around the idea that marriage is in part to protect somebody and you know, protect their chastity and protect their desires. And um, the, it's also been mentioned that desires at the first level of the soul, like are, you know, a bad thing, right? And so how do we reconcile the two? Really good question. So um, the way that we look at desires is that in and of themselves, it is not bad to have that desire. Allah, Allah created the desire in the human being, right? Now he created the desire for a reason. So it's not that Allah created the desire and it's now blameworthy in and of itself to have that desire. So I'll give you an example. If you did not have a desire for food, or drink, which I have a desire to drink this now because I'm thirsty. One second. But if someone didn't have that desire and like somebody like me who just talks, 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 probably till I know everybody, right? If I never drank any water, I would die of thirst because I just wouldn't have the desire in me to drink. If I never had the desire in me to eat food, I would never eat food, right? Because it's just not a desire Allah created. And so the, he created the desire to eat food for a reason, he commanded you then in the Quran to eat food, right? And to eat and, 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 and to be grateful to Allah. Where that desire gets blameworthy is when someone goes to excess in a haram way where they're so into the food that they're like, I forget halal, forget this, forget that. I'm just going to eat whatever I want. The same thing with sexual desire. If you did not have the desire for the sexual desire, how would the human race exist? It wouldn't exist. How would the, the, the ummah of the Prophet grow? It couldn't grow. It wouldn't. It's not, it's, not, it's not going to grow. So that desire is there for a reason. But what Allah wants you to do in the test for the human being is to control the desire from an impermissible outlet. And this is true for all the desires that the human being has, to control them from impermissible outlets. So the impermissible outlet here would be somebody is um, getting caught up in adultery, fornication, hooking up with people, and so on and so forth. Now, when somebody enters into marriage, that gives somebody the halal way, right, to, okay, now this is a normal desire Allah created, and now he created this permissible means for someone to have that desire. It's not that they were supposed to eliminate the desire and then enter marriage, because it wouldn't work, and it's impossible to eliminate that desire. You cannot actually, in, in reality, like truly eliminate something that Allah has created. You can reduce it to the point where it maybe it doesn't come up in someone's life, but you will not completely eliminate it, right? Even the people who barely eat anything, they fast, 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 they, they still deep, they have to eat something, 
right? It has to be there for, for subsistence and existence purposes. So for generally speaking, for the majority of human beings, that's not going to be, of course, just like completely eliminated. And that's where the Prophet ﷺ is showing us that, hey, this is not only is this a permissible avenue to express that desire, but you'll get good deeds for it. So like, don't think that worship, there was actually one of the, 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 um, uh, one of the Sahaba, one of the Sahabiyat that she came to the Prophet ﷺ and she meant she complained about her husband because she said that, you know, um, he just prays all night. He fasts all day. He exerts himself to the point where he's literally like super, super thin. And I've stopped dressing up for him and looking nice for him and so on and so forth. Right. Um, and the Prophet, he, he said that I sleep and I, I pray and I also sleep. I fast and I also eat and I break my fast. And I also, right, engage in relations, right? Like he, that was a very, very, and we know all the details of ghusl and so on and so forth because the Prophet told us this is how somebody goes from it. So that's the, 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 the first part to the answer is that it is not an haram desire in and of itself. If the desire is channeled towards haram, it becomes haram. If the desire is channeled towards permissible, it becomes a good thing. Then when it comes to working on someone's, uh, on oneself, um, there will be varying degrees of this. If someone doesn't have like literally the basics of their life down, right? Like they can't even, that they can't even function. They don't know how to have conversations. They don't know how to like, you know, have work or do anything, right? Literally they just, let's just say they're very, very, very young or just highly, highly immature. Yeah, it's probably not the best decision. Like, hey, for some, you know, get some, someone gets married. But there's also the other end of the spectrum where someone does not have to be fit, fully refined and perfect. It's like someone has the basics down. Someone is working on themselves and, and somebody knows that, hey, now I'm going to enter into this relationship with somebody who's also going to work on themselves. And now in this partnership where Allah says that he created you from the same soul in order that you may get, have sakina, that he will give you a state of tranquility in the marriage because you are with your truly your soulmate, which you could not have otherwise, right? And so that's a very, very important aspect of, uh, of marriage to, 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 to keep in mind, that it's not someone enters into, the, into, a, into a stage where they have to be you know, fully perfect beforehand. The majority of our life is to work, to work on ourselves. And the majority of people will marry and have the majority of their life in front of them, right? Not behind them, especially in terms of like the age of actual post-puberty and maturity and being able to think, the majority of their life will be in front of them. And so as a result, you just have to have the kind of basics down and, um, and then you will know uh, by, by doing two things, by doing istikhara, asking Allah, and istishara. Istishara is asking your elders, uh, people you trust, teachers, so on and so forth, They're doing consultation, that is, is it, is it the right time? Right. And you just want to avoid doing consultation with people who their framework is not in line with the Islamic framework. If their framework is no, 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 wait till you're, you know, ABC age and you've done X, Y, Z in life. And no, it has nothing to do with the, the tradition and the religion and nothing to do with practical life things, but it's just a Western framework. I would, I wouldn't consult those people generally. I would generally consult people who are going to look at things from the Islamic framework. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. They'll use the, which, uh, what is an excuse? To force someone else or for themselves to get married? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see exactly. Okay, so the, the question was for those who are online that some people will literally push others to get married. Um, like parents might push someone to get married, even though they're not ready, simply for the reason that, hey, this will help you control your, your desire. Um, now, there's a couple of things to keep in mind here, right? When it comes to something like this, there is not compulsion. La ikrah fid din. There is no compulsion in religion. You cannot compel someone, force someone to do something. 
right? Parent doesn't, cannot force their child to get married. That's, you are, that is beyond the, they can request, they can insist, they can persuade, they can beg Allah, they can beg their child, but they cannot force them, right? You have to have permission and it has to come from your own volition, right? Generally speaking, that would be the situation. Um, so in that instance, the, the, that, that, would, that would, someone would be doing something wrong. And that justification, people use religion to justify things all the time that are wrong. And that's also very why knowledge is so important. Because the vast majority of Muslims in our time right now, as the Prophet prophesied in the Hadith, that ignorance will prevail and people of knowledge will be very few. People who actually learn the deen will be very, very few. And so the vast majority of us in our time right now, there's a huge knowledge gap of how to do things. Of the, on one hand, the vastness of our tradition, right? And the importance of like respecting people of different, different opinions and so on and so forth. And then on the other hand of the importance of like actually following rules in our tradition, the importance of like not getting caught up in, in new ideologies that come about Western ideologies and so on and so forth. Right. So there's so many gaps in knowledge because if you haven't grounded yourself in, in the religion first and someone goes and engages with the rest of the world and then they knit, they pick and choose oh, I want to apply this one today, but never, nothing else matters. The parents might not even pray and so on and so forth. And they're like, oh, no, 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 but you have to get married because of this. And they might only be doing it for cultural reason or it might force someone in. So that's a very important kind of distinction to keep in mind. You have to know and the person has to know enough to say, hold on, this doesn't sound like the religion, right? And usually things divorced of mercy are generally not from the religion, generally speaking, are not, right? Um, of either mercy in this life or mercy in the next life. Are there any other questions? Yes. You started going off the tangent from when you were talking about future marriage, and you started giving an example of Muhammad Ambar. And at one point, when one of his wives had passed, his son brought, told him he, he had these two sisters who could marry, and one was really attractive, and the other one was religious. He said, Give me the religious one. Right. You know, and I want to just mention that, you know, um, it's so important to have a lot of discretion. Um, you know, be, think carefully before you get into marriage, because if it's just further, because just because this person, like, you know, interests you, like physically or something like that, then you know, you really have to live with the spiritual, the religious, spiritual side day in and day out. So you want to have love for them, yeah, for their unseen, their, their inner realms. Right. Exactly. It's very, it's very, very important. Exactly. No, thank you for that, for that point that the inner dimension and the religious aspect, right? Well, attraction is totally fine to consider that that cannot be the only thing someone should not be the only thing someone considers when considering a spouse and the day in and day out is going to be based on someone's character, right? So like you could have somebody who's not attractive and really good character and takes really, really good care of you and so on and so forth. Or you could have, it could be the inverse as well, right? Somebody who's very, very, someone's very attracted to them but they really struggle to live with them. Don't take care of each other and so on and so forth. And then of course, someone could have both, right? And it's just, it just depends. So it's a very, very important to be thoughtful and mindful about that decision. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll go ahead and just finish up this chapter and then we'll end and just see some questions. Okay, cool. So um, just to end off, so he now is just going to do a quick, quick overview of um, other daily ibadat or sorry, daily regular actions that someone um, will do. So he's going to cover the sunnah and the etiquette of using the restroom and then we'll go ahead and end here. Um, and again, important here, someone might say this is such a basic mundane act, but somebody will do this action often in their life, right, throughout the day. And so if someone can bring an element of spirituality and intentionality to it, it's going to give them reward. And so the sunnah of entering the restroom is that somebody first ideally puts something over their head, that they put their left foot forward as they enter. When you're entering places of purity and goodness, you enter with your right foot, such as when you're entering the masjid. When you're entering places of, of, uh, that are not pure and, and dirty, you enter with your left foot, right? Um, and so you enter with your left foot. And you exit with your right foot and you say, Bismillah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-khabaati wal-khaba'ith. That, oh, in, in the name of Allah, 
Oh Allah, I seek your protection from the demons, from, 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 from the uh, male and female demons, right? And then when someone comes out, someone says, Ghufranaka, Ghufranaka, Ghufranaka. Oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, alladhi adhaba anni al ada wal afani. That Alhamdulillah, praise be due to Allah who removed harm from me, what was harmful inside of me, and made me healthy. And so it's amazing because literally the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us here that when you enter into this place, you're mindful of Allah. When you exit from the place, Allah has helped somebody literally cleanse their body of toxins. That if someone is not able to use the restroom, literally toxins will build up inside of them. So you have to praise Allah for that. And if anybody has ever struggled with any type of stomach situation or other problems or travel issues, they know how difficult it can be, right? And so you praise Allah and you say, Alhamdulillah, right? And so you, you, you end and or you, you leave the restroom with the right foot and you end with the dua. Someone should be very careful to not say the name of Allah in the restroom, right? That's not something you would do. To not be on, bring things in with that have the name of Allah on them um, and, and so on and so forth, right? And someone should try their best to protect their clothing. This is especially in the time when, when uh, you know, they didn't necessarily have, oh man, I'm struggling. They did not necessarily have um, private restrooms. And so there would be more of a chance of their clothing getting soiled. But someone should, of course, try their best to protect their clothing from being soiled as well. Um, and making sure that doesn't get that. Yes. It's just speaking it. You can think it. The more you think it, the better it will be. Yeah. So the question was um, that is it just about saying it or about thinking it? And when when you're in the restroom, it's just saying it and not like it, that's not the place someone has the Quran out or someone is you know uh, looking through like some something related that actually has the name of Allah on their phone as well, right? So if if someone has to be on their phone or something like that, then to make sure that there's nothing at all. Um, with religious, with, with Allah's names on it, yeah. Yes? It's not considered good. So he mentions that, so the question was speaking in general. Um, he mentions that if you must speak, right, only do it when necessary. Uh, and 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 it's not, it's not again, not like a, you know, virtuous thing to, to be doing. Yeah, it's not like haram either though. And then ideally, somebody also tries to not um, face the qibla when using the restroom. That's important. Again, that's going to be difficult if like that's just how the, situ the, the, the restroom is built, right? But that's, that's, if someone like gets to build their own restroom, they should make sure that, they, that, that the direction, neither their front, whether where they're actually using the restroom is facing the qibla, nor their back, but especially their front, um, right? And so it will be difficult. If possible, the other thing is to not um, stand or or to make sure that that the clothes are not at all soiled with anything from the restroom, especially with urine. It's very, very, very important. For he says that a large part of the grave's torment, that the, the, the punishment someone faces in the grave, according to a hadith, is because their clothing was they were they were basically careless when it came to clean their clothing with regards to urine. So now that gets to the topic of like, and again. You know, pardon me for going this in detail, but it's just important because um, you know he's covering it here. But generally speaking, uh, men should not be urinating in urinals. That's not that's not from our tradition. And the sunnah is to sit down and to use the restroom. And if somebody absolutely has to because of a difficult situation, stand up. But definitely, someone has to be very careful about anything getting on their clothing, be by any means at all, right? Um, you do not want to have things coming on, on your clothes. And so uh, Western society is not clean when it comes to these practices. Generally speaking, right? they just discovered bidets and these types of things. Like it's, it's, it's the Muslims, they, they've, they've had this for many, many, many millennia uh, and, and centuries um, in terms of cleaning themselves. And so you want to make sure all the clothes are clean. And then um, somebody should also try to make sure they clean themselves with water and with something dry. So both is better. If they don't have an option and they only have one, then water um, would be preferred. And uh, essentially, that, and another thing is someone should use their left hand when it comes to cleaning themselves. The right hand is for, 
is for things like eating, reciting the Quran, and so on and so forth, right? The left hand should be used for cleaning yourself when it comes to the restroom and, 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 and these types of things, right? Picking up something dirty and so on. Um, that, that's, that's, that's important. Again, it just shows mindfulness. Someone's like, okay, trying to be mindful of using the what Allah would want me, what the Prophet ﷺ taught me to use and what Allah would want me to use. So without getting into too much detail here, um, that, that should you know, generally cover what someone is, needs to be doing with regards to uh, the sunnah of using restroom. So it's entering with your left foot, exiting with your right foot, saying the dua before entering, which is in the book, Bismillah, Allahumma ni a'udhu bikam al khabati wal khaba'it. And then saying the dua when someone leaves the restroom, you leave with your right foot. You say, Ghufranaka, 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 Alhamdulillah, Alladhi adhaba an anni al adai wal afani. And, or if someone doesn't know the dua, just say, Ya Allah, thank you for for removing what was harmful inside of me. And, and, and please forgive me for anything and my mistakes. And then to be clean, to focus on making sure the clothing is clean and to making sure the body is clean. Very, very important parts of the sunnah. And again, the believer is a clean person. Be the believer is generally clean. As we talked about earlier, the believer smells nice. The believer has good sense coming from them. The believer is, it doesn't have um, uh, excessive dirt and so on and so forth um, on them. Exception is like someone lives in the desert or something, they have different rules for that, but, but for, for people who are not in those situations. And then just lastly, he mentions the sunnah of um, other small actions that someone will do. So if someone sneezes, someone should say, Alhamdulillah, hey, Rabbil Alameen, you say, Alhamdulillah, someone else should say, Yarhamakullah, if you hear someone sneeze, right? So you say, uh, someone else says, Yarhamakullah, may the mercy of Allah be upon you. Um, and, uh, and then, if, you know, a few other, a few other sunnahs. And so the, the main thing is just to be mindful in all the actions, right? Don't do something without thinking, would the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam do this thing, right? And there are all these things then. You entering the masjid with your right foot. You leaving the masjid with your left foot. You entering the restroom with your left foot. Leaving it with your right foot. You doing these du'as. They bring nur into every action. This is the way that these simple actions turn into noble actions. Right? That somebody could not do that much extra worship throughout the day. They do their fard, they do a few sunnahs, but throughout the day they're doing these dhikr. That means the whole day will be dhikr because they'll always be like either you know, sleeping, waking up, putting on their clothes, taking off their clothes, using the restroom, so on and so forth. All the actions that we've covered, right? drinking the water, eating food, finishing their meal and so on, they will have a dhikr associated with it. They'll be mindful of Allah. Inshallah, if you remember Allah, remember that Allah remembers you. We'll end with that. Remember me and I will remember you. If you remember Allah alone, right? Allah, or if you remember Allah with people in, in a gathering, Allah remembers you in a better gathering. So Allah is remembering you and you couldn't remember Allah if he didn't give you tawfiq to remember him. He didn't give you assistance to remember him. So it's a huge deal that somebody is able to remember him and it's the best thing that you and I can be doing. And with our time, is to make sure in all of our moments, at least we try to remember Allah. And if we can't do so, at least in these, these actions, and then we try to go and continue. And may Allah assist us in that. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik wa ashadu an la ilaha ilaha astaghfiruka wa tsubu ilayk wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We'll just do, anybody has any final questions? Uh, I know where it's late. Uh, yes. <laughs> So the last part that you mentioned, you just just finished the last sentence. I didn't quite hear it. Yeah. Are you referring to adults or children? Yeah. Okay. Adults. Okay. Got it. So a question was that how important is it to to make sure that somebody is like not forced or coerced to do certain things? It's a really good question. In general, people should not be coerced, especially in our society. Now, that's a general rule. There, so someone should not be forced. Like if you remind someone to 
let's say let's say you're reminding someone to like um uh to it's slightly different for the action. Let's just say even the prayer. So you're reminding someone to pray. They say, no, I don't want to pray. And you're reminding, no, you need to pray. You're reminding them to say, you don't have any authority in any way over them, right? If you are their mother or their father and they don't pray, you can put consequences there, right? And the consequences start with merciful consequences and then they get to the more strict consequences, right? No, you have to pray. You are required to pray because they literally don't know better. They just want to, let's say, play their video game and watch TV or whatever it is. Like, no, 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 it's time for prayer. All this is off or ABC, right? That's one thing. Then if somebody is an adult and someone does not, is not in a position of like, they're not the, the leader of the Muslim state or something like that, they can't, there's no consequences you can force someone to do. You can't drag someone on the street. Hey, you Muslim, it's the hard time. Go pray. You can't do that, right? But now then there's like all these other situations. Where it's like, okay, somebody does not want to dress in the way that somebody prefers. You have to do an assessment. If I force them to dress in this way, right? Let's say modestly. Um, Will it do damage to the longer term understanding of this re longer term relationship and the longer term understanding of uh, what modesty even is? Because will they really be doing it for the fear of Allah or will they be doing it for that situation, right? And now this is where like the delicate balance come in. The I ideal is you advise them nicely and gently, hey, it would be better if you did this, right? I would really appreciate if you could do this. It would mean a lot. And you know that Allah loves it when someone does, you advise them nicely. And then someone can, if they have, depending on the dynamic, right, who it is and what they're saying, can say, you know, if it's a parent and child or if it's, a, you know, spouses, it's different than if it's siblings, right? With siblings, you don't have any authority over them, essentially, right? So you're, you can say, hey, go change your clothes. I don't want to. It's, not, it's my decision, right? Not yours. They're held accountable for that decision. So it kind of will depend. But the general rule, I would say, in our time is don't coerce people and force them. you got to give people time. Because you don't, there's so many Muslims leaving the religion, so many Muslims leaving the religion, and so many young people struggling with the religion, that if someone forces somebody, they could get such a sour taste in their mouth for the entire deen, because you force them to do like a few things, that they might, you might be the reason why they end up having a bad taste in their mouth for Islam. This is actually the case in some of the ways that the Muslims, how strict and harsh they are with things, right? Just force, strict harshness you have to do this you can't do this and like they've lost the mercy they've lost the love they've lost the way that the prophet ﷺ did things so in general coercion is not a, not something we should be doing um it's very few exceptions when it comes to like you know you really make sure your kids are acting up on or acting according to certain things and in general somebody should be very very um merciful towards things and direct their attention to allah advise somebody and then direct your attention to allah but you're not truly you don't truly care about someone actually changing if you're not begging Allah in the middle of the night, asking him to help them change. It don't, doesn't mean you don't, the sincerity has not gotten to its perfect form yet. There's a lot of room to go because you actually think your words will do anything. It won't do a thing. Allah is the one who guides. Only Allah can guide, as he mentioned. So if Allah wants to guide their heart, he'll guide them. You can assist. And if Allah puts assistance in your words, mashallah, Allah will guide them through those words. But he's still the one who guided. And that's why he has to be... Um, the one who somebody asks for assistance. Yes, question. Uh, after the book, yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, I, right now we're like barely, we're just getting halfway through it. Um, yeah, so there's a fair amount more to go, but like a lot, some of the other next like couple chapters are kind of condensed into one. This one was a really, alhamdulillah, a, a longer one. Um, so the goal is we'll probably be doing from with regards to schedule for the class. We'll, we will most likely, I think we will have class next week actually. And then the following week will be off. So most people are off and then we'll resume that the first week of January. We'll go until we finish the book. The intention is for us to keep the Wednesday class going, you know, continuously and we'll change the book right at some point or or the topic itself we might not always go from a book we might just have a topic and then go based on the topic and i might pull from different texts and whatnot um we did that like two three years ago it was just topic was patience there's different tests we we're pulling from on patience let's say um does that answer the question yeah no problem yes question and what we'll Yeah. 
Say that one more time. Oh yeah, good question. Yeah, so in the for the for the is the question was about istikhara and what is the format of that. So what you would do is you would make a niyyah for two sunnah of istikhara, okay? Of this this of Allah assisting you in your decision. You after you finish your prayer, you open up the dua of istikhara, you can literally google it or yeah, I can I can send it to you as well and then you uh, you make the dua after you finish the prayer. So you say salam alaykum rahmatullah, salam alaykum rahmatullah, you sit down. It takes like a minute to make the dua. And in that dua, you're asking Allah, oh Allah, if you are the one who knows everything, if this situation, let's say getting married is good for me, do this person, please facilitate it and make, make it good for me or, or, or facilitate it for me, right? And if it's bad for me, then remove it from me and let me be content with whatever the decision is. That's the kind of summary of the, the dua that someone is making. So you do that afterwards. And if you, you can also, um, you know, you try to do it in Arabic, but if someone's still learning or someone, you can do that in, in English with the meanings. Um, and then you kind of work your way to do it according to the, the words that the Prophet did. Does that answer? Okay, alhamdulillah. So for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and end. I apologize. Um, always going late here. Um, alhamdulillah. So yeah, just to clarify, we will, have, we will inshallah have class next week. Um, and then we will not have class the following week. So in between the 25th and the 3rd, that week, right, where it's like many people on winter holiday and so on, we will not have class next week. We will inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin. Wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu minal balimeen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa kinna adhaban nar. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. We ask Ya Allah that you give us understanding and that you give us forgiveness and that you grant us nur and that you grant us light and that you grant us knowledge and that you grant us tawfiq to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Allah. Pardon anything it is that we have done in our lives or in, that we have done. Ya Rabbil Alameen, Ya Allah, that you are displeased with Ya Allah, and please be pleased with us, please remove our anxieties, please remove our worries, please remove our problems, Ya Arham Rahimeen. Ya Allah, we ask you for everything good that the Prophet Sallallahu asked for, and we ask you for protection from everything evil that he asked protection from. We ask that you remove all of our tribulations, that you cure those who are sick, and that you assist those who are struggling with any difficulty. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.